Hello and welcome back to another video. In this video we're going to talk about best practices for error cutting and error handling. Alright, so we have a lot to cover in this video. So here are the points we're going to cover and of course we'll go into each one of these in more detail. Those points are to be very thorough with your error checking, to do your error checking first, to handle errors at the earliest appropriate place. One exclusively for exceptions is to put the minimum code that you can in your try blocks. And finally, if you're going to recover from an error to restore state and resources. And by the way, when we talk about error in this video, we mean basically anything that can throw an exception or if you're using error values, then any error value that signifies an error. So we don't just mean bugs, we mean anything. All right, let's get to it. So point number one is to be very thorough with your error checking. Okay, unfortunately, programmers are not perfect. Okay, we make mistakes and we make mistakes often. And that's why we need so many error correction practices in our code, like static type checking, testing, code reviews, and all of that stuff. We, we need a lot, okay? So for a program that doesn't have errors, you basically need to operate under the assumption that everything is going to break. Anything that can throw an exception, right? Like if you're using Java or something, certain methods declare what exceptions they may throw, assume that those exceptions will be thrown and be ready to catch them, right? You should be extremely thorough with your error checking. You should always catch all possible exceptions, check all error values, and then handle them appropriately. All right, point number two is to check for errors first. So this is a stylistic convention. You don't have to do this for super correct code. But, you know, if you look at the examples of the code in the screen, we have one where we check the error first. And then we have another where we run some normal code first. Then we check, you know, is parameter A what it's supposed to be? We do our error checking here, right? So generally, you want to check for errors as early as possible in your code. And that's because one, it recognizes your code into like recognizable blocks, right? And that's like error first, normal code after. And if all your code is like this, then it's easy to, to understand where is your error checking code, where is your normal code, and it's easy to distinguish between them as well. And secondly, it helps with debugging, right? Because if an error occurs and you need to debug something, well, you have less code to look through if the error always occurs at the top of your code than if it occurs, you know, way far down. You'll just have more code to go through before you see what happened and why did stuff happen. All right, the next point is to handle errors at the first appropriate place. Now, the reason for this point is because you can't always handle an error immediately, okay? Consider the example where you've got some code that searches the file system for a file. That file system code, like a method in Java or a method in JavaScript, the file system module or something, if it doesn't find the file, what should it do? Should it crash the program? Should it create a new file? Should it search for a backup file in some other location? Or should it send a message to the user saying, hey, I didn't find the file, please give me another one? The low-level file system code doesn't know what the correct action is for your code right? Some code higher up in the call stack, your application code, not just the find the file code, some code higher up is the code that can decide what to do about this, right? And that's because different programs are going to want different behavior. Sometimes you're going to want to display an error to the user and ask for a different file. And other times you might want to, I don't know, create the file or something and return an empty file or something like that. And that's why you can't just have default hard-coded behavior in there. And that's why you can't always handle the errors where they show up. You need to let the error propagate to a higher place where it will be handled. So if you're using exceptions, that means you need to let the exception bubble up to the place where it will be handled. And if you're using error values, then that means you need to manually return the error values up to the appropriate place. But a point that goes hand in hand with this one is that you should handle errors at the first appropriate place. So yes, you need to let them bubble up a bit sometimes, but don't propagate them higher than they need to be. You know, the, the sooner you handle them, 
the better. And that's simply because the code that handles the error is closer to the point where the error was raised. So it makes it easier when you're debugging to see, okay, the error happened here and this code handled it, right? The further away you go, the more debugging and the more tracking you're going to have to do to see how everything works together. And finally, just to illustrate the point, here is a quick code example. So in this code example, we basically have a file called mydatabase.js, which has a function in there, get sprite by ID. Now, that function may not find the sprite that it's looking for. So what it does is it throws an exception. And if you look above, we have the two handlers. We have the app.getLine and the app.postLine. And in there, they both use the function get sprite by ID. But because they're two different pieces of code, if the sprite isn't found, then they need to do different things. So the first one returns a 404, and the second one redirects the user to the form page so that they can do the thing again or whatever. And this illustrates the point where you can't have the low-level code handle the error for you. You need some handlers higher up sometimes to do it because they're the ones that are going to know what needs to happen as a result of the error. All right. Next, we have a point that's exclusive to exceptions, and that is be careful of how much code you put in your try cut blocks. So generally, it's considered best practice to put as little code in your try blocks as possible. So that means that, you know, whereas before you might have had one big try block with, say, 15 lines of code in there, you probably want to take the code that is not going to throw exceptions outside of the try block, and for code in the try block that can throw exceptions, you probably want to separate it into different try blocks. So you might end up with three try blocks instead of one. Now, the reasons why you might want to do this are because, well, it's easy to see which code raises exceptions and which exceptions it raises and which code doesn't raise exceptions. It also separates concerns more cleanly and more clearly. So generally, you should be able to take a try cuts block extract it out into a separate function, you know, call the function in there and it just works because the relevant functionality is more tightly grouped and you can visually see, okay, that's one piece of functionality, that's another piece and so on. And probably the most important point is that it prevents the accidental swallowing of exceptions. So this is the case where you have a line of code that is not supposed to throw an exception. Okay, you don't expect it to ever have something go wrong with it, so you should never throw an exception. But you put it in a try block, and lo and behold, you have a bug somewhere in your code base, and the result is that this code throws an exception when it's not ever supposed to throw one. And you're not, your code isn't prepared to handle it. The problem is that because the code is in the try block, the exception might get caught, right? It might get caught in the cuts block over there, and that's a problem because your code isn't able to handle it properly. It wasn't expecting it. So the program will continue executing and it's going to do the wrong thing. You're going to have an error that you haven't properly recovered from. And that can be disastrous as we've spoken in some other videos. So that's why if certain code isn't supposed to throw an exception, right? Don't just put it in a try block so that what we just talked about doesn't happen. Finally, the last reason why you might want to do something like this, separate different try blocks is because, well, if different code can throw the same exception type, but you need them handled differently for each line of code, then obviously you need different cuts blocks for that. The flip side, unfortunately, is that this makes the code potentially far longer than it was before, okay? So here is where you will have to use your judgment. You are the expert, right? You're the programmer. You have to use your judgment and consider, hey, have I got as much correctness and clarity as I need over here, right? And if you do, if you can maintain that, then maybe it's okay to combine the code into, say, a single try block. Hopefully now you understand the reasons why it's good to separate it, and that's correctness and clarity, but as long as you can maintain those, it's within your right to combine them. You know, you can make the code a bit more concise if it's still correct and it's still clear what's going on. For some code examples, here is some code that I consider to be pretty good, okay? It could be separated further, but it's pretty good, right? We have a single try block 
And the lines that may throw exceptions here are where it says new buffered reader, then it brackets new file reader. So that may throw a file not found exception. And then the dot read line part may throw an IO exception. Okay. But in this case, both types of exceptions are handled in the same way. So the code is pretty good. It's not too bad. If you really wanted to separate them further, or particularly if you needed the different exceptions to be handled differently, then you might do something like the other code instead, which has the two try blocks. So what do we have here? So we have an outer try cats block exclusively for the line with new buffered reader. Okay. And then we have an inner try cats block in there for the buffered reader dot read line. Now the inner try cats block handles the problems with a read line. It catches the IO exception and the outer one catches the file not found exception. And also notice that here we could actually take the inner block, we could extract it into a separate function with no issues. We don't need to mess around the code, like re restructure the order of the statements and whatever. So yeah, so if you wanted something really separated, really clear, you might do it this way instead. All right, and a side note before we finish with this point, both of these examples were both for example, what you would actually want to do in real code would be to use something like the with statement, using statement, or try with resources statement. So what that would do is it would open the file for you, or whatever it is, you would run your code and then it would automatically close the file for you in the end so that you wouldn't need the finally block that we have there so that you never actually forgot to close the file, which could cause a big problem. All right. And the last point for this video is to, if you recover from an error, then you might need to restore some state and some resources. So if you recover from an error, it means that the code can continue executing correctly, right? As though the error never happened. Yes, something went wrong, but you've cleaned it up. Everything's fine now. The program can continue execution. If that's not possible, then obviously you haven't really recovered. Okay. So sometimes, depending on how your code is structured, you might need to manually go in there and fix some state and also close any side effects. So let's talk about the restoring state first. So consider that some of your code is something like what you see on the screen there. So in this situation, the line where it says do something, if something goes wrong there, then the is busy variable will always be true. It will always be in invalid state. Okay. Obviously that can happen because if your program wants to recover, you need to have correct state, right? So instead you would do something like this here. This is the version that you would have to do. So basically same thing as before, except in this case, if do something has an error, if something goes wrong, it's no problem. We cut the error, right? And then we return the state to what it needs to be to false in this case. So normal execution is fine. And if you recover from an error, you're still fine. Okay. Now you need to do the same thing for every function in your code, though, if an error occurs, everything must have the correct state, not just one or two functions, everything, right? So if you look at the graphic on the screen there, in this particular case, we have a function foo and it calls f1, f1 calls f2 and f2 calls bar and bar throws an exception, which is handled all the way in foo. Okay. Now, any of those functions from bar to foo may end up with invalid state when we do that. So just like we did with our little example here, we also need to fix the state for every one of them. So what we would do, and this becomes a lot more complicated now, is something like this. So we have the top level function handle user event, which calls the function foo, which calls the function bar. In our example here, we only have three functions, not four. And the code in bar and foo is basically the same as what we saw a second ago. So bar, you know, is exactly the same. If something goes wrong, we cut the error, we correct the state, and then we throw the error again. The reason why we do this is because if something goes wrong, we can't just let the error propagate because then bar will never fix its state. So that's why we need to cut the error in bar, fix the state, right? That's where we have the line is busy equals false. And then we need to throw the error again because what well, the error happened and the, the parent code that called the function 
it still needs to go through the error handling process as well. So it may seem a bit more verbose, but in this case, this is what we have to do. In full, same exact thing, right? We need to correct the state, so we cut the error, so we can correct the state, then we throw it again, because again, we need to delegate the error to the parent, okay? Hello, this is Piros from the future, just with a quick correction. Just wanted to mention that you don't explicitly have to use a catch block and throw the exception again. An alternative approach that you can use is you can just use a finally block without a catch block. So what that's going to do is if an error occurs, the finally block is still going to run. And because there is no catch block, the exception will be thrown at the caller. So in the end, it achieves the same result and both pieces of code you see on the screen are equivalent. And then finally, in the top level function handle user event, that's where we catch the error, that's where we handle it, and that is where we would, for example, write a message to the user and say, hey, something went wrong, please try again with different data, or something like that. And just a few notes about this is that normally you don't need to do this. Normally you're not going to have functions that are written in such a way where you need to manually correct the state of multiple functions in the call stack. So this is fairly rare. More normally you're going to have stateless functions. So really all you should need to do in most cases is if you have an exception that's thrown down here, just let it propagate up to the correct level and handle it there. You shouldn't need to do, in most cases, what we just did of fixing state in every level. All right, the second part of this point, just as we saw, if something goes wrong, code stops executing, right? And state is left in an invalid state. Similarly, you might open a side effect. For example, you might open a file, right? Like the code shows on the screen. And if an error occurred and you didn't, you know, catch it or use the finally block or something, the file would be left open even if our parent code, right, the caller, handled the error properly. So we can't do that. Just as we fixed state a minute ago, we need to also close the side effects. So you would do something like this, right? You would have a finally clause, or if you were using error values, you would do it so that the file is closed even if an error occurs. So that's basically it. I hope that it made sense. And I hope that you can see how you might need to do this stuff in your programs to have programs that are robust and work correctly, basically, that can handle all possible errors that can come up. For next steps on error handling, I recommend that you watch the other videos in the error handling series. So anyway, so if you like this video, then please click the like button. If you want to see the rest of the videos coming up in this series and many more, of course, then please subscribe. And if you have any comments, any feedback, you know the drill, anything at all that you want to write, then please leave a comment below. All right, thanks very much and see you on the next one.